Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's a great privilege today to, to have uh, uh, Professor Gopal Badlani from uh, the Wake Forest Institute of Urology in the, in, the, in the USA. He is the vice chairman and director of the Department of, uh, of Urology and the co-director of, of Pelvic Health in, uh, in Wake Forest in North Carolina. And uh, he, he, he has done a lot of uh, original innovations in uh, female urology and uh, is a surgeon par excellence. I was fortunate to have spent a little time with him in his, uh, in his department where I saw the, the, the diverse range of, uh, of surgery that he does and, his, and more importantly, that is his, his very original thinking. I would uh, I would invite Professor Sanjay Kulkarni to say a few words, and then we can start the program for which we are actually all looking forward. Thank you, thank you, Over Dr. You, Panda. Thank you, Dr. Panda. We are very fortunate at Urology Society of India to invite Dr. Gopal Badlani, our staunch supporter of Urology Society of India around the world, and he has spent his lifetime studying this anatomic review of the female pelvic floor and I have listened to him over a period of time since I saw him for the first time in Edinburgh Urology Festival that was in 1983. So I have <laughs> known him for a long period of time and then uh, I am looking at this animation the amount of effort to, uh, that one has to put into not only think but do an artistic impression of this uh, is uh, incredible. And then we are very lucky to have Gopal uh, of his, to see his lifetime work being presented today. Uh, Sujata, you want to say something? Uh, sir, uh, uh, definitely we are privileged and uh, 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 due to the efforts of Dr. Badlani sir and Dr. Arun Chawla, you would be having this series of events throughout the year. And I would also request sir to continue to extend his uh, uh, the webinars and of, of course whenever live he comes to India and we can specially also invite him and continue because from February I would be taking in as the chairman of uh, ISU and I request him to please continue this series with uh, me too. Thank you sir and please welcome to the lecture. Um, thank you very much all of you. Um, the purpose of the animation was to hypnotize you before we get started. And if you're not hypnotized, you will notice one big thing that I hope you have noticed already, that this is a post hysterectomy specimen and or animation. Uh, that is what most of us as a urologist see, although working with uh, Praveen and Moa, uh, hysterectomy is no big additional part of the procedure. And he has taught me a lot going to MOA and learning from it. So anatomy is something that we can describe. It varies in every individual. Um, so you need to be cognizant of variations in anatomy, although the landmarks remain more or less stable. You need to have a 3D imagination but particularly in the pelvis, because if you're approaching it vaginally, all you see is the vaginal canal and you can feel the different aspects of it, but you have to know what's in the front, what's in the back, what's on the side, in lower vagina and upper vagina to sort of know where to go in safely without harming the um, other organs in the vicinity. Prolapse is a significant, as uh, as well as incontinence is a quality of life issue and it affects a significant amount of women. And it is estimated that by age uh, 70 to 79, uh, you'll have 11 operations per, but also notice the recurrence rate about 30% that occurs if you do a tissue-based operation. We as urologists focus more on the incontinence, less on the prolapse. The same patient who presents, we sort of ignore the prolapse. If we learn prolapse, we learn a little bit about anterior approach, but forget the posterior aspect. We forget the apical prolapse. Thus, the success rate drops if you just focus on one aspect of it. I would like you today to think of the whole pelvic floor as one unit 
think of yourself. If you know the word hammock, you're lying down on a hammock and the hammock is tied to two trees. The hammock has a net of strings that is holding you. If the hammock stays out in the backyard for a long time, it will sag or stretch over a period of time and the strings will weaken. At some point, the string will break. Either your bottom, your leg, or your head will fall through. That's what pelvic floor is. And that's what one needs to think about. The basis of support is the bony structure. So you need to think about the pelvic inlet. We learned that from a stratical point of view, but now you look from below upwards to understand the relationship of the, of the pubic ramus the coccyx, the ischial spine, as you'll see, these are the landmarks. You should be able to feel the ischial spine when you're doing the vaginal exam, sort of posteriorly and to the side, you should be able to feel it. Uh, there is the pubic ramus in the inferior and the superior aspect on the inside of it is where the attachment of the uh, arcus tendineosus. That is another location, very important. If you're doing a birch procedure, that's something, a landmark. Ischial spine is where the sacrospinalis ligament starts. So these are palpations that you should be able to recognize. Um, so here is the location of the ischial spine and the sacrospinalis ligament to the sacrum. This is a tough structure and you see the angle, you should be able to feel in an intact person vaginally, this all the way medial. You will now learn that there is a vascular structure on the outer one centimeter. So if you're going to put a suture, you need to put it at least a finger breadth or two finger breadths here. If you go superiorly, you have the bone, and you end up touching the bone, here are where the nerves are coming out. So if you put a suture way up here, you're gonna get into the nerve. So it's important to locate what's happening because ligament is not standing out, is overlaid by the muscle. You should be able to get through the muscle into the ligament in order to put a suture. If you just put it in the muscle, it's gonna tear out pretty soon. So relationship of these muscles overlying the sacrospinalis and in the levator hiatus, we'll go over this. You'll see a, a lot of repetition in different angles just to get you to orient and visualize from different aspects. Now overlaid on the structures are nerves. As you can see, they come out, they parallel, they go through the foramen in the back. So just going north of the sacrospinalis ligament, this is nerve entrapment that occurs. You need to be very important, aware of it. Positioning of the patient in a lithotomy also has effect on this. So you can damage or hurt depending on overextended lithotomy position. Next is vascular. Fortunately, big arteries are very lateral. So unless you're aiming from them, it's hard to get into them. But there is a big plexus in the pelvis, mostly with the veins that need to be worried about. The bowel on the left side is lower than on the right side because the right colon is up there. And then the ureteral anatomy need to think about where the ureter is lying in relation to, to the bladder as it comes this way. In a significant prolapse, that becomes a player. If you're going abdominally or robotically and repairing it from above, especially in a birch procedure, your is in play here, you need to be aware of it. Those of you who do hysterectomy, obviously need to be aware of the urethral vicinity just near the cervix. That venous complex, in the retropubic space and in the perivesical space is a source of bleeding most of the time. 
It stops with pressure, mostly after vaginal surgery, but every now and then that's a big problem. Peritoneal cavity and relationship is important so that if you're doing vaginal surgery, particularly in post hysterectomy, you need to be aware that the pelvis, the peritoneum is right behind there, right just above the dome of the vagina, and you can get into it. Getting into it is intentional for us most of the time if you're repairing an intraseal or some other aspect of it. So the concept of endopelvic fascia, this is collagen containing with some difference whether there is any smooth muscle in it or not. Think of it as a saran wrap, you know, that clear plastic wrap that you put around the luggage. Um, by itself is very flimsy, but if you wrap that around any of the packaging, you know how tough it is. You need a sharp object to pierce it. It won't tear that easily. And that's how this endopelvic fascia is. There is a sandwich. There's an inner aspect of it and the outer aspect of it with a muscle layer in between. Laxity or tearing of the endopelvic fascia with collagen defect is what we worked on for many, many years to show that this collagen containing endopelvic fascia is weaker in patients with stress incontinence and prolapse. So now you're looking, your vision is from below, vaginally. Bladder is upside down. Here's the urethral meatus. This is running behind the anterior vaginal wall and the bladder is here. Depending on the degree of laxity of prolapse, there is more bladder below. There is the uterus behind at the apex and then there are cardinal ligaments. At the top of the uterus is where there is the broad ligament. Here, most of our work, if you're doing just sling, is in this area, mid-urethral support. You're making an incision here, going next to. So this landmark is very important. There is a clear demarcation when you do a vaginal flap surgery. There is a compartment that is above the bladder neck and below the bladder neck. If your dissection ends up in this area, your sling or procedure will be difficult. You'll be in the wrong plane. You need to be going towards the shoulder of the patient in this direction to get into the retropubic space. If you're going to do the retropubic sling, you need to come, this would be about where the pubic ramus is. You need to be coming through into the operator fossa here for a transobturator sling. If you're doing a single incision, you're just limiting yourself to this area. So the whole support is here. Why is mid urethra important? Because that's where the mobility of the urethra is. The hammock that I showed you initially is supporting the urethra, not pulling it up. It's just sitting there. So when a person coughs, that is being supported. And if it's not supported, there's laxity. And you can see this on an examination where the urethra or the Q-tip will move more than 45 degrees when the person coughs. Cystocele repair is being done in this area. This is the fascia that is torn for the cystocele to drop or detached from the side. So there is the lateral cystocele where the attachment to the arcus tendineus is torn and the whole support is lax versus a tear in the middle, which causes a midline cystocele. That is less common. The lateral cystocele is more common. So now this is a view, obviously this is a cadaver and you're looking at the pubic bone here. The urethra is going this way, the bladder is here. On the side, you can see the pelvic floor and the endopelvic fascia. The vessels are quite lateral. This is where the operator foramen, you know, the operator nerve is, et cetera. But your fixation or where you're coming through from below is somewhere here in this area. 
Uh, so it's safe away from the bladder, safe away from the urethra. There's no big structures here to perforate the endopelvic fascia. This is a conceptual diagram just to show you the midline, the pubic bone, how the bladder is sitting behind it, and the relationship of the rectum, the vagina, and the space you're going through is like in this area. A diagram to show you the attachment of the arcus tendineus. Your, your space that you're working in is, is in this space. You've made the vaginal incision, you've opened the vagina, and then you're entering this space, like so. That's how your dissection is going. Now, the concept of ligament is just condensation of the endopelvic fascia. You think of a fishing net. If you pull it, you get these lines of strain. And that's how those ligaments are formed. Condensation of the endopelvic fascia causes these ligaments to form. Now, once again, if you're looking at uh, the ischial spine here, the uterine level is here, and the repair, depending on if you're repairing the apex of the vagina, this is important part. Uh, is there a question from the audience? Uh, so this is bladder where I'll be doing the anterior repair. And depending if I'm repairing the apex that I'm repairing in this point, fixing it to the ligaments in the back. So targeted repair would be sling, mid urethra, bladder support, apical support, and then in front of the rectum at the very bottom would be the perineal repair. All this is in this trapezoid, which is the levator muscles. So if you think of, um, the repair, you have the fascia, the muscle, and the urogenital diaphragm. This is a sort of a netter's diagram to show you the length of the vagina, the bottom third, the upper third. This is where the apical support is. We'll show you in a minute, the angle of the vagina is extremely important in terms of understanding. Now let's focus on the levator hiatus. This is a group of muscle um, and these four names, you'll see it many times. They've, they've sort of fuse in the midline to form the levator plate. So individually, this is the pubovaginalis. This is the muscle more around the bladder. Then you have the puborectalis. This muscle goes around the rectum, like in a sling. Then you have pubococcygeus, which is the muscle attached to the coccyx. And then you have this muscle, which is the iliococcygeus. This is overlying the sacrospinalis muscle. So the first three form the pubovisceralis, which are supporting the three organs. And then you have the iliococcygeus, Together, they maintain a tone of the pelvic floor. Remember the concept of hammock? Everything is supported. This is like a trampoline. And this white line is the arcus tendineus. And there are attachments here to the here, right? So that is how the floor is suspended. The levator hiatus is this hiatus that you can see on an MRI that if it's detached from the arcus tendineus on one side, you see a tear here that allows the detachment or lack of support in terms of the, the Vader group. So that's, you can identify that on an MRI. This is a lot of a cadaver dissection to show you the levator hiatus. Now this can get very wide like this so that everything can fall through that part. So what you have is the three aspects, the urethra, the vagina, and the rectum going through this hiatus. 
and the angles are very important. So you have the concept of the M line, which is under surface of the pubic bone to the coccyx. That's showing you the support or the motion support. And here, what we call the genital hiatus from the pubic bone to the posterior fouchette of the vagina. So depending on the length of this, the hiatus is widened and the support can be lost. So you'll see the levator hiatus. This would be the genital hiatus. That means the opening into the hiatus. And then you have the M line. You see how both this hiatus is elongated and this support is lost that it's coming down. That means the plate which is supposed to support like this is not supporting adequately. And these can be measured radiographically to show that the non-prolapse versus prolapse group is different and the motion in the M line is further. Visually, when you're examining the patient and you have them strain, you can see this coming down anteriorly or posteriorly. And so we talked a little bit earlier about the arcus tendineus. That is the point of attachment. And when we put sutures to support, we try and tighten this here with the birch procedure. Um, and with the sling procedure, the slings are coming from here to here. And you, what you are looking at is the levator plate, which is here, uh, supporting the top of the vagina. Um, it's very, very important to understand that the levator plate, the vaginal angle, you can see is like a banana. That means the upper part of the vagina sits on this levator plate. And when, when this, there is an abdominal strain, the plate stays and the pressure collapses the vagina. If the angle is lost or the support is not good, it just prolapses below. That's what happens. So levator plane or angle of the levator is in reference to this. Uh, you can see this angle normally is parallel to that. And you see what happens when the levator plate is lost. This angle is very widened. The whole plate is coming down and you get the posterior laxity. And this happens because our colleagues who do hysterectomy don't make an attempt to repair the top of the vagina. They just take the uterus out. Now the angle is like set. And so post hysterectomy prolapse, not only does the apex come down, it pulls the bladder down with it. When it pulls the bladder, the urethra angulates. The ureters are coming all the way down here. So all the altered anatomy happens in this prolapse. Now, we'll go over the stages of prolapse in a minute, but that's what you got to recognize. So in terms of the function, you need to look at, uh, in terms of the levator plate, and the other fixed point is called the perineal body. Now, perineal body, of course, it's very relevant in males as well as in females but the perineal body is right in front of the rectum, right over here, which is divides the anterior compartment to the posterior compartment. But that is the fixation point for these muscles or this center. And the perineal body is, is not fixed well, then you have a problem in terms of things. So you see where the perineal body is in relation to the rectum and uh, in a male, when you're doing bulbar surgery, and Sanjay would be an expert on that, is where we re release the muscle. The bulbocavernosis muscle is attached to the perineal body. Uh, you are well familiar with the male. That's where you detach the urethra. If you're doing a male sling to move the urethra up, or that's your fixed point in terms of the anatomy. And the rectum is behind and you repair the rectal muscle in front. Uh, so this relationship, where you are in space, is an important one to know. And the transverse perineal muscle is what we bring together in terms of the perineal body repair.
So another visual basically to show you the different relationships of the muscle, the coccyx here, when you put your finger in the vagina, you're feeling through the rectum and all the coccyx here, the ischial spine, pubic ramus along with the muscle, uh, and going further is the urethral meatus. The other aspect, which is not so much anatomical, but it's functional, is to look at the thickness of the urethra and the coaptation. So you can see the urethra that is scarred completely. The urethra doesn't come together. And in injecting Vulcomed or today or collagen before is where we um, uh, inject to bring the walls of the urethra together. So anatomical theory is what happens? Does the organ fall out or what happens to it in terms of the support? So Delancey was a very uh, famous um, gynecological anatomist, basically he's talked about the mechanism of prolapse is falling inside out, you know. Uh, it's intra-abdominal pressure, the chronic coughing, and the weakness in the endopelvic fascia and the support that causes pelvic prolapse. So you have forces from above. As long as this plate is intact, the pressure is absorbed by the plate. If this is detached here, then when you force, this descends, causing loss of pressure in the urethra and support loss. So all our repairs are to simulate the support around the urethra, but not obstruct it. You're supposed to just lay it there so that when the urethra needs it, it descends into that support, not tighten it. And depending on the uh, arcus tendineus repair, depending on what you want to use as your repair mechanism, you're either repairing the tissue that's torn or you're placing a graft to replace the tissue. It's a dry dock phenomena. That means a ship in the water is easily supported by these. If there's no water, the same weight is too much for these lines to bear and they'll break. So the support is very important from below. When you examine the patient with pelvic organ prolapse, this will ask you, what am I? And you have to know, is it the uterus at the end or there is post-hysterectomy, this is old bladder or this is an inverted vagina with a bowel behind it. You need to know in a single speculum exam is helpful to compartmentalize everything. So you put it against the posterior and push the anterior to see if the prolapse is still present. And then you examine the anterior to see what the posterior prolapse is there. And then you finally evaluate the apical. Function of the urethra, remember I said to you support, the normal range is somewhere here. If it goes beyond 45, you have lack of mid urethral support or hypermobility. The bladder can drop here and in its support. There are various classifications. <laughs> Baden-Walker perhaps is more famous. It is the leading prolapse, whether it's the bladder, the uterus, et cetera, that determines the degree of prolapse, whether it's inside the vagina or outside the vagina. Grade two is inside the vagina. Hymen, or where the hymen was, is the borderline. Prolapse up to that point is grade two. Prolapse outside that point is three or four, depending on how much it has come out. So Baden-Walker is what we currently use. But what's important for you to learn is something called the POP-Q. Pro pelvic organ prolapse quantifying is you have three axes. So vaginally, you're looking at the front axis and you have two points of reference. AA, where is the mid urethra? BA, where there is the base of the bladder. There is the posterior wall and you have AP, that's the rectocele, and BP where there is 
enterocele occurring, right? And then you have C, which is the top of the vagina, and D is the posterior fornix, which is the deepest portion of the uh, vaginal wall. So genital hiatus is from the opening from front to the back of the vagina, basically, to see that height. The space between the um, back of the vagina and the rectum is what is lost when the genital hiatus is bigger. Uh, it seems complex. All you have to remember is one reference point, AA. If you remember that, everything is in relation to that, right? So mid urethra rarely descends in down there. It may move, causing hypermobility. So if I remember, this is supposed to be minus three, three centimeters inside the vaginal cavity. Everything else is in relation to that. So the bladder has come down to here, here, or here. So if his bladder is down, which is normally supposed to be minus six, is five, four, three, two, one, or zero. Zero is at the hymen. The apex does it come down to this level here. So everything I relate to either you can use your finger as knowing the length of your finger, what it is, or use a scale to be able to measure what's the prolapse. And you in a, we have a template which has all these seven marker points and you need to fill out those numbers preoperatively after repair and in the future. That's how the POPQ exam works. You have exact numbers. This way there's no subjective grade two or three. And this is something that you need to visually think about and each time write those measurements in your exam. That gives a very objective follow-up point. So now I'm ready to talk to you or answer any questions, clear any so just go through lifestyle, basically, you know, what you do and how important everything is. You go in a whole circle. At the end, you're back to being wet again. So that ends the first um, presentation. I'm open to questions uh, if you wish to go over it. Oh. Definitely, sir. It was a very nice uh, presentation of a bit. You could visualize quite a few things with, with your graphics. They were really lovely. Sir, I would like to ask you a question as to um, when uh, uh, do you differentiate between a uterine prolapse and a cystocele or the bladder prolapsing? in the vagina uh, only clinically or every time you put these figures and then you, these are for reference or they are for uh, the surgery also, sir? So POPQ evaluation uh, is every single time I examine the patient, that POPQ template goes in. So, okay, certainly so at the, records. Yeah, certainly at the initial evaluation that you referred to, I may not do the vaginal exam each time the person comes, but if I have initial evaluation, she typically comes back if necessary after urodynamic and six months, a year go by before I gonna operate on her just before surgery, once again, to confirm the initial findings. And then after surgery and the first or second visit is to confirm that the repair is intact and where we intended it to be. Okay, so Arvind, uh, would you like yes. to? Uh, yes, it's absolutely, absolutely mind, mind blowing uh, presentation, sir. It's very clear, very crisp. Uh, my question is uh, if after hysterectomy, effort is made to you know fix the the uh, the vagina, uh, will the will the chances of world prolapse decrease? Uh, yeah, so a little bit of an extra effort. Mostly these are sutures that take the upper vagina and fix it to the back plate, to the sacrospinalis ligament and or uterosacrals. Um, depending on the skill of the surgeon, the uterosacrals are very stretched out in a prolapsed person. Um, 
if the hysterectomy is done for fibroids, then it's not such a issue. So fixing it to something that the upper vagina remains flat on the levator plate, bending backwards, prevents future apical prolapse. Um, you know, we get patients after the fact that, you know, hysterectomy is a quick part, preventing prolapse is a second part. We see the most difficult is post radical cystectomy where a portion of the vagina is removed and nothing was done for the vagina. Now that is a difficult case to repair. When that person comes with prolapse, there's nothing between that vaginal thinned out lining and the peritoneal cavity and very little to support. So those prolapse are even more difficult. Now we as urologists don't do anything to the vagina after doing a radical cystectomy. So is, uh, is there likelihood that if the patient uh, is postmenopausal, uh, the, uh, the, the tissues are, are uh, because most of the cases, many of the cases when, we, when the hysterectomy is done for uh, sometimes for, for, a, for uh, uh, we, they also remove the ovaries. So, so likely, will the repair be a little, little bit tenuous if they do it? And uh, how commonly have you, see, have you seen that, uh, that the pelvic floor is, is more stretched out then so the repair may could be a little more tenuous? Uh, so, I mean, certainly menopause has a role in the vaginal wall and the urethral mucosal height. Um, there is implication of actually, believe it or not, lowered testosterone in women who have pelvic organ prolapse or stress incontinence. So lack of androgen for muscle support is blamed um, more than estrogen loss. Um, but menopause itself is not the number factor for pelvic organ prolapse. It's, you know, there are phenotypic cause. So how many children did she have? Does she have chronic cough? What's her weight? What's her overall muscle strength determines the pelvic floor uh, behavior. There is the genetic aspect where, um, you know, there is a gene that controls the breakdown of collagen, which is faster in women with stress incontinence and prolapse. That is regulated to some extent by the hormone. Perversely, estrogen heightens that. That means it makes it worse. Uh, the breakdown in those patients who have a higher collagen turnover and testosterone prevents it. So those are all theories. Obviously, you know, these are papers published in terms of testosterone role. So there is an increasing interest of treating some forms of stress and content with mild doses of testosterone. Um, but in general, this is surgical injury, which occurs with hysterectomy is you're basically cutting off the ligaments, whatever they were to attach to the vagina on the top and holding it back. So the uterosacrals are holding the top of the vagina back towards the levator plate. It's like a horse hitch, you know, that thing, the, the strap that holds the horse, you pull it and the neck goes up. That's how the top of the vagina is. If that is lax, it falls down. The cardinal ligaments are side attachments, again, to the top. So it depends on the laxity of that. And when you repair, you don't even attach them across to each other. Um, you're going to have a prolapse. So, so Gopal, you showed some beautiful photographs of uh, MRI scan of the pelvis. And how frequently do you use it uh, for clinical indications? Uh, uh, floor, uh, MRI. We used to do it for a while routinely when it was a fad maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, stopped doing that routinely. Now, in a case where there's recurrent prolapse and or intraseal, which is a big part of the prolapse, 
there I want to see the relationship of how that infraseal is coming. Is it coming from like top of the vagina or it's dissecting its plane in front of the rectum and coming? It's a different repair for both. So uh, that that's one situation. Whereas bladder, we assess much better with the video urodynamics, so don't need that. Sir, I had one question that usually in this orthopedic surgeries, when there is, whenever there is a tear in the ligament or in the, they put a, put a collagen sheath on tap on top of it in addition to the suturing. And then they have these studs, which are pretty expensive, five lakhs and eight lakhs. And then they do this repair. While we as urologists, we don't use this, sir, or they use it in the U.S.? No, it was, again, tested. People, there was one investigator who would put the material and in, go into the retropubic space laparoscopically or robotically, if you want. That time it was laparoscope. You just put this sheath, um, whatever material you wanted, and they are called origin tackers. They are like corkscrews. You just tack them and you take a tacker and put it in the arcus tendineus on either side or, you know, the pubic tubercle area. So now you're lifting the endopelvic pressure from the front, uh, which, you know, didn't make sense. You needed to be behind the urethra, but you were supporting the whole structure. I mean, you reported it for one year, and then you never heard from him. So uh, oh, it huh. was like a modified birch procedure done very easily, done from the front. The collagen... The only material, you know, if you've heard of surgicis or SIS material. Yes, um, so SIS is very forgiving that you, wherever you put it, that's where it becomes. And orthopedic uses it, plastic surgery uses it, etc. But it's collagen based and it's supposed to be replaced with patients' own cells. Conceptually, and believe me, uh, we tested it, we tried it. Uh, in, you know, as a HIPAA disclosure, my mother had SIS repair, uh, but it failed very quickly in about 15% of patients. So cumulatively, yeah. if you're doing this repair very quickly, you collect patients that have failed. So the breakdown rate and replacement with surgical tissue was not. So the only thing that has withstood the time of is the mesh, is proline mesh. However, it is maligned today as being a bad thing. Um, yes. Uh, you know, yet the same mesh is put from above and it's fine. It's put in men and it's fine. It's only maligned if you put it vaginally. You can put it for a sling, it's okay. But the moment you mention it for prolapse, it suddenly becomes a bad thing. Uh, my personal belief is a lot of technical reasons why vaginal mesh fails. Uh, people do dissection differently. If you are used to doing tissue-based repair, then your flap in the vagina is very thin. If you're going to do a mesh-based repair, then your flap needs to be different. So uh, I've believed and done mesh repair for so many years, but today, you know, with every patient, I have to spend a half an hour to, to make sure she understands why we're doing it. Scientifically, it can prove that it is needed and it's done, but um, you know, can't fight uh, the industry. Correct. I mean, it's the people who are against the industry, rather. Right. So there was a question in the uh, chat box that uh, whether uh, the um, uh, measurements of this POP for prolapse are different in different races. No. The, these are, the measurements can be different. That means the prolapse can be different, but the landmarks are not different. So the POP markings, um, you know, the four spots or five, basically two in the front, two in the back, two in the top are the same, but it could be different. So the vaginal depth could be different. Um, um, say an Indian woman versus that. It's not been my experience. When I examine patients and, you know, predominantly do 
either hysterectomy or prolapse repair or fistula repair, it doesn't seem any different. Okay. Yeah. Oh. So we can say, is there a second part? And uh, Yeah, so, um, sorry, I have to share screen. Uh, where is my presentation? Oh, sorry. Give me one second. I had it open, but now it's... Oh, can you hear me still? Yeah, yes. we can hear. Yeah, we can. We can. We can hear very clearly. Okay. So. Um, Too many presentations on your laptop, Gopal. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I had it you open. Yeah. You may have reduced it. Yeah. Okay, now can you see it? Yes. Yes, yes very good. Okay. Um, all right. So this is a 57-year-old female, uh, presents with urinary incontinence and urinary frequency. Uh, she's had two vaginal deliveries, postmenopausal with incontinence. She describes her incontinence to be an after dribble leaking. Now, is there such a thing as after dribble leaking in women, or does it occur only in men? Who is my target, Sujata? Who is the resident? Yes, sir. I, I can see a lot of students, so I would request... Uh, just, uh, pick, just pick any one of them. Manju or uh, Sarika. Anybody? Supradeep? Yeah. Would you like to answer those questions? Supradeep is my student. I hope he's uh, listening. Supradeep? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, would you like to answer Dr. Uh, Badlani sir's question that whether post void uh, dribble occurs only in females, uh, in males, and does it occur in females? Uh, sir. Uh, sir, if there is any uh, urethral diverticulum, then there can be post-void dribble. Excellent. Excellent one. I give you one-third credit. Tell me more. Uh, so, like, does overflow incontinence occur in females? Uh, does it? Does the bladder, which is over-distended, overflow like that? Does it so happen? That would be different. It can present as stress incontinence or unaware leaking or continuous leaking. So, you know, post mm -hmm. dribbling is most patients present, they are not aware of leaking. They just find themselves wet. And it occurs in uh, three separate sit settings. One is Young girls, where they have labial adhesions, urine hits the labia, goes into the vagina, they dribble after. It occurs in women who, as you know, many women tend not to sit on a public toilet and they sort of hover over a public toilet and the clothes are not all the way down. So the thighs are together, urine goes into the vagina and dribbles out after. Uh, it occurs post-sling procedures 
Uh, or if you're straining a lot to urinate, some urine will go into the vagina and it will come out after they pull up their clothes. So they typically describe, I finish urinating, I get up, and then I have a leaking. So that's, and they be, need to be taught how to urinate and how to empty the vagina to avoid dribbling. So if you don't question that properly, you may walk away with the impression that this lady has incontinence, does she have urge or stress incontinence, and the testing may or may not show that. Then she wears two to three pads a day, are moist when they change. So there are two important informations here. If you ask the lady, how many pads a day do you wear? She tells you three, and the other lady tells you one. Which one is leaking more? What's the young man's name? Supradeep. 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 Uh, uh, sir, the one who is um, changing more number of pads. Yeah, that's the first impression, which may not be true. So you have a lady that even with two drops of urine in her pad, she changes it. Whereas the other one lets the pad soak before she changes it. So not only is the number important, you got to ask the question if it's just damp, wet, or soaked. Those are three different quantification of urine loss. Otherwise, you walk away with the wrong impression how much urine she's losing by the number of pads alone. Okay, so it's important to do that follow-up question. Um, so now she has symptoms of incomplete emptying for which she double voids. How is that relevant in a woman? If she gives you that history, um, so Pradeep, you can pick a colleague's name, your choice, and you can tag, you know, what is that lifeline and Kon Banega Kroor Prati, you transfer to someone else. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. you can answer first. Yeah. Uh, like incomplete emptying can, might be because of significant postward residual urine. Okay. Yeah, uh, but in, in OPD, when do we advise double voiding? Do you remember? So. Remember what your first answer was, correct, postword residual, could be, that's a true sensation of incomplete empty. Sometime it is a feeling rather than actual fact. And these patients will empty the bladder a lot by pushing. And at the end of it, they still have the sensation, another drop, another drop is going to make me feel better. So I keep pushing to get rid of the last drop. Happens more when they start to urinate with a very small amount of urine in the bladder. And the third aspect in particular today's topic is where you have anatomical reason why they have incomplete emptying or difficulty in emptying. If the bladder is significantly prolapsed, the urethra is turned around and they're not emptying the bladder truly and they have difficulty urinating. And they have to, to physically push the bladder up into the vagina to be able to empty. And typically, the patient will tell you, I empty easiest first thing in the morning. The rest of the day, it gets more difficult because the prolapse is reduced when they get up. They're able to void. The rest of the day, the prolapse is significant that they have difficulty voiding. All right? Um, so she leaked. Uh, she does not leak with um, increased abdominal pressure. What is the significance, again, in a person who has significant prolapse, but she does not have stress in common? Uh, sir, the significant prolapse can itself cause obstruction of the bladder outlets. So that might not cause uh, stress urinary incontinence. Like if there is a significant uh, uh, um, a prolapse, the, the urethra and the bladder neck might get compressed and it might uh, prevent the stress urinary incontinence. So I will give you partial credit. You're saying the thing correctly, but concept is a little off. That means when a person coughs, 
Typically, the pressure is transmitted through the urethra to cause urinary leak. Here, there's an easy pressure into the prolapse. So the pressure transmission is into the prolapse with no incontinence, right? It's similar to a bladder diverticulum where the bladder is contracting, all the urine is going into the diverticulum, it's not coming out of the urethra, correct? Y yes, sir. So conceptually, what you said, the angulation and compression, et cetera, is true, but it's really the pressure transmission that is occurring. So if you repair the prolapse, what will happen? Uh, the uh, normal anatomy will be restored, sir. The... And then? Uh, the uh, in, increased intra-abdominal pressure will be equally distributed into the bladder as well as proximal urethra. So what might happen if I just repair the prolapse? Uh, if just repair the uh, prolapse, then the, uh, the um, and anatomy, if it is restored, then the intra-abdominal pressure will equally get distributed and the stress-related uh, stress incontinence will reduce. Mm, I want you to hold on to that thought. We'll come up in the discussion again. Just think what you answered, all right? Just remember that. So she has urgency and frequency without urge-related incontinence. She avoids um, variably a lot of times. Um, no hematuria, malignancy, etc. Normal bowel function, no fecal incontinence. Now, these are two important questions. Bowel function and fecal incontinence. It's important to ask that in your patient who's presenting to you with prolapse, incontinence, etc., because you need to address the rectal aspect at the same time. Uh, no point fixing just her bladder and she still has fecal incontinence, right? So important to know that. Past medical history. Um, Significant, here she's divorced. Why is this highlighted? Why did I highlight? You even ask that question in patients when they come to see you. So Pradeep, what could be the possible reason apart from the divorce? Well, uh, you you haven't tagged anybody's yet, so we keep asking you. You can tag anybody, because I don't want to pick on you the rest of the evening. <laughs> okay, the, so what? If she you, has leakage, could that be an issue? Yes, ma'am. One is incontinence and also the significant prolapse can itself cause hindrance to sexual activity. Also. No, if I ask the person in the history, are you sexually active or not? And she says not. Why is that relevant in my treatment evaluation? So, you know, in, in choosing many different prolapse repairs, the easiest repair is to close the vagina. It's a procedure called colpoclysis. Uh, it's very less invasive. Uh, and the person is older, not sexually active, you don't need to do any fancy repair, you just close the vagina. Uh, but that's only possible in a patient who, who's not sexually active or don't intend to be sexually active. You can't offer that to a 40 year old or a 50 year old who's active or wants to be active. So the first two points what Sujata mentioned is correct. She cannot, she's not sexually active because she's leaking and she has a prolapse, but she intends to be active after repair, that's a different versus saying, I'm not going to be active. So yeah. that's the relevance in the history. Yeah. So even Lasgo's uh, uh, colposis <coughs> was used to treat uh, vasicovaginal fistulas also, no, sir, in the, uh, in the past? Well, there's Lasgo. That's, be, uh, that's, which could that, not be repaired. Right. That shortens the vagina but doesn't close yeah. the vagina. That's just quick repair for okay. the fistula that brings the anterior front, you know, but it doesn't, they're typically at the apex and you do two circumferential incision and you bring the vagina together, but it shortens the vagina, it doesn't close it. Okay. All right, so here we have 
This may not be relevant in India, but for us, it's very relevant how heavy the patient is, okay? So again, you see a picture of her prolapse and hypermobility. There is no urethral diverticulum. So the postwar dribble is not due to that. Uh, so um, her apex is well supported. She's post hysterectomy. Tissue is well estrogenized. I should give you more POP measurements. I don't know that they are in this presentation. Anyway, urine analysis, normal except for leukocytes, staph negative, culture. What does this typically signify? Uh, uh, sir, it might be because of contamination, sir, improper. Right. Sir. Good answer. PBR is 150. Is that significant? Yeah, yeah, sir, it depends, sir. We have to again repeat the measurement. If it continues to be elevated, then significant. All right. So, does she need to be treated? Uh, sir, if a uh, patient is get uh, is planned for surgical intervention, then in the perioperative, like just before the induction, not like uh, we have to give antibiotics uh, beforehand. So, uh, be same rule applies. If you have a contaminated and or a culture positive urine, treat the culture and or prophylactic before doing urodynamics. You know, so, so now she's getting avoiding diary. Um, so the top half is urination. Unfortunately, she hasn't measured the volume which she's voiding. Typically, most of our patients will give us a few measurements of their um, urine out, but uh, she doesn't leak with physical exertion. And she had one leaking episode that she described, but mostly you see variable frequency every hour, several hours in between. So what happens here? You see a pattern that's night pattern is here, okay? Yes, sir. And this is daytime. What do you make out of patients that we talked about this, I think the last time, a person who can sleep for six hours, but has marked frequency during the day. So the first thing we do is to rule out that there is no significant fluid intake during the day accounting for this frequency. So it doesn't appear to be. She's only breakfast, lunch, dinner. That's what she's doing. Some drinking before going to bed. The other is sensation is different during the day. The prolapse sometimes gives you that feeling as if you had to pee uh, and you end up urinating and you're not emptying. Whereas lying down, that prolapse is not a bother. The bladder capacity may be normal. So let's find out what's happening. Are you able to see the tracing? So uh, yes, for sir. the orientation, this is bladder, this is rectum, this is neck tip through the pressure, this is EMG, this, this is volume infused. And the flow is here and the volume voided is here. Okay? Yes, sir. So, um, so first half of the filling curve, anything abnormal? Uh, sir, there is no uh, overactivity uh, initially. So, uh, there is so it's better to say it's a normal filling curve, correct? Yes. And the compliance yes, is normal. Yes, sir. Correct? Okay, yes, here is the video image at the same time. You see this? Yes, Bladder uh, tracer is there, sir, and uh, lower down there is collection of the urine. And yeah, what uh, is that? Uh, sir, it might be diverticulum. Mm. We saw that the lower. clinical picture, no? We saw the clinical <laughs> picture. What exam. could that be then? Uh, exam dikhaya to bhi usko diverticulum bol raha hai. Sukhradeep, dikhaya na prolapse hai. Urine in the prolapsed part. What? Say the word. Cystosis. What is the prolapse bladder called? Uh, cystosis. Ah, it's better if you say that in the beginning, right? It would save five questions. Yes, sir. Right. 
Okay. Now, the second half of the filling curve. What's happening here? Uh, sir, in the terminal part, there is some uh, over activities there. Okay. Uh, over activity. But there is no... Uh, one small leak is there, sir. At okay. the last activity. Otherwise, okay. no. And then... And, uh, complaints appear to be uh, normal. Okay, how does she initiate her voiding? Uh, uh, initially, there is training. Sir. Yes, so there is training associated, right? Right through the, there is the truser, but she's okay. training along with voiding. So that's why you see this stop start pattern, yes, right? Sir. So now there is DO during voiding. So what should we do for her? Uh, sir, first uh, uh, we have to uh, ask her, uh, give her uh, education regarding behavioral therapy also, sir. So uh, she's come, so that alone or we need to do more? What about the emptying? What, what do I do? Uh, sir, for since she's uh, symptomatic, and there is significant prolapse, we should offer her surgical therapy. Correct. But one important lesson is, if she's come to me only for urinary bother and is not bothered by the prolapse, I will find options to treat her for urinary problems, not necessarily offer the re repair of the prolapse as my first choice, okay? So I can offer you, if you are not improved with bladder training, I'll give you you know, bladder medications, your retention might get worse. And if you're willing to do self-calf, that's a way I can address your urinary symptoms. Whereas if you want to correct anatomically and perhaps improve the outlet obstruction related um, bladder overactivity, then we can talk about the repair. All right, those are two different options. And what can I do temporarily to improve her symptoms? Uh, we can teach her uh, pelvic floor exercises, sir. M uh, muscle training exercises. Again, true in the book, but somebody who has this degree of prolapse, that's not going to make a difference, right? I can't put the prolapse back with that repair, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So therapy or physical therapy is a good concept in a patient with mild incontinence and or mild prolapse. And it's a good muscle strengthening, but not a treatment. What's the other conservative treatment for the prolapse? Mm. Sir, Amita Jain has answered as pessary. Amita, please, Correct. if you want to speak, you can go ahead. Amita Ji, talk to me. Um Yes, sir. Uh, so, pacing can be done because um, uh, it will correct uh, the cystocele part. And um, sometimes it has been seen that even uh, once you are correcting uh, the cystocele, there could be decrease in the urgency and component as well. And we can uh, actually give the medication as well because the fear of high PVR with prolapse won't be there if their pacing is there. All excellent point. What is the other benefit of using the pessary in this lady? Which we did not demonstrate on your dynamics. By wearing the pessary, her stress incontinence may be unmasked. Correct? That's that means... Urgency frequency disappears, emptying is better, and now she's having stress incontinence. Yeah, sometimes uh, once uh, there is uh, associated distress incontinence, and um, uh, because of the urethral kinking, it's masked. And, uh, uh, but uh, the urgency component could be because of that, because uh, urine can come because of the urethral incompetence in, uh, inside the urethra during activity, like it's seen in her voiding diary. During daytime, uh, during activity, once the urine is there in proximal urethra, it can actually uh, stimulate uh, bladder contraction. So sometimes that could also be the thing, um, and it will be unmasked on wearing pastry. 
Okay, you said a lot of good things, but you mixed up a few things. So I want to sort of clarify what I heard as your answer. Okay, so one aspect of wearing the pessary is you're correcting anatomical change. So the angulation of the urethra is corrected. Her emptying could be better and her urgency and frequency that's related to increased PBR and bladder overactivity due to obstruction is corrected, right? Now the urgency that she currently has during the day, the concept of urine entering the urethra, which is change of position, does not hold true in patients with obstructive prolapse. It holds true of patients who have incompetent bladder neck and they change position where the urine enters the urethra, right? So your reasoning or rationale for getting urgency better is correct if you say the obstruction is corrected or the prolapse is corrected. What I was trying to ask you is by correcting that, now I've made her urethra straight and if she has stress incontinence, it helps me to plan her surgery. And that is what we didn't do in her urodynamics. What's the deficient part? You should correct the prolapse by reducing the prolapse and testing for stress incontinence during urodynamic testing to what we call occult SUI. But by wearing the pessary, I would unmask that. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. All right, so if we embark, she agrees to having surgery, what are her options? Shall we do a mesh augmented vaginal repair or tissue-based repair, or should we repair abdominally? So uh, because it's the first uh, time she had the problem of um, prolapse and mainly cystocele. So it can be repaired vaginally without any uh, synthetic mesh, provided that uh, there is no occult stress incontinence. If it is there, then uh, we can counsel patient. Either it can be do as a step procedure after correcting the cystocele, uh, we can plan it as a second surgery or it can be done simultaneously if patient agrees, because uh, it's true that after preparing the cystocele, her SUI component can increase after the surgery. So we have to see, we have to examine the patient and counsel accordingly, and it should be with her consent. And all excellent points. Um, there is anatomical urethral hypermobility in her case, but unless I demonstrate stress incontinence by reducing the prolapse and or she gives me a positive history. In rule of thumb, you should be able to see stress incontinence before you put a sling in a prolapse patient because you don't want to make the voiding more difficult after surgery. It's about 18% chance that she will have stress incontinence after you repair just the prolapse uh, versus about 5 or 10% of retention rate after doing a prophylactic sling. So that's a very important discussion with the patient because if you do the prolapse repair and she becomes incontinent, she's very unhappy because she never had stress incontinence to begin with. And if you never talk to her about it, then it's your problem, your complication. Whereas if you talk to her about it and gave her the option, as was mentioned, then you make that choice with the patient, right? Um, so I would just like to make a comment uh, yeah. about the previous slide, sir. You said that would you use a synthetic uh, uh, mesh for the vaginal repair of the cystocele? So uh, right now, sir, what is our uh, uh, the consensus about use of synthetic mesh? So the board answer would be what she just said. If it's the first time repair, uh, you would do a yeah. tissue-based repair. If it's a recurrent prolapse, then you can have that discussion with the patient um, regarding uh, synthetic mesh use. So it's highly controversial, at least in the US, uh, whereas the sling mesh is okay. Um, I have a personal bias and I use mesh. Uh, so, I mean, that is not a patient decision. So 
patient needs to decide and take the risk. With that repair, I will tell her that there is a 30% risk of recurrent prolapse in the future. Uh, the recurrence of prolapse definition is also changed. So she has a grade three prolapse to start with. If she comes back two years later with a grade two prolapse, I still in my database write her as a success because it's not outside the vagina. That's how the new definition is. But from the patient's perspective, she has a recurrence of the prolapse. Unless she seeks retreatment, she's still considered a success. Whereas for me, anatomical success is where you have restored um, the anatomy. And that can be only done with a mesh with a 10% risk of mesh exposure. Yeah. So she needs to choose between 30% and 10%. But sir, yeah. uh, majority of those uh, patients, even in India, now they read these things on the net and uh, they don't agree for a synthetic mesh because uh, it's, it's portrayed by, the, uh, by Google and on various sites in a very bad yeah. manner. Correct, correct. So that's true of here too. Uh, my own colleagues, they will put the mesh in you know, what is the exposure rate when mesh is used from above? Do you know? It's still 10%. No. So the difference, if you look at the Loyola, very large randomized study uh, from above, there was 7% exposure rate. Overall, you have to quote the same 10 exposure rate, especially if you're doing it with hysterectomy. Without hysterectomy, it's maybe less. Um, but... It's not that there is no exposure when used abdominally, but yeah. uh, based on what you just described, public and the legal system, it's currently uh, a no-no. Yes, sir. We can go ahead, sir. Okay, we talked about all these already. So this is what I was talking about testing uh, for occult incontinence by reducing the prolapse and by putting a packing in the vagina or reducing it using a sponge stick to look for any leaking. Um, I wasn't planning on doing the whole repair talk today. That's sometime in the future. But essentially, in large prolapse, you can, you know, if I'm using a mesh, I use a very small incision. If you're using a tissue-based repair, then you go all the way up to the bladder neck. This is the cystocele component of it. And you're doing dissecting the mucosa away, which, you know, and then if you're going to put a mesh, then you need a four parent anchoring. So where you anchor at the pubic tubercle and then you anchor at the sacrospinalis. So you have four points of fixation to be able to do the repair. But if you're not, then you do plication of the, um, and bring the levator hiatus together. And that's how you do the repair. So questions? Uh, we spent enough time. We've yes. nearing. I think absolutely yeah. a great presentation. A lot of clarity. Uh, we can <coughs> uh, do we have anything in this chat box? Uh, no, nothing in the chat box. So, anyone has any more questions? Yeah. Uh, anybody in the uh, audience? All right. Wonderful talking to you all. I'll see you next time. Whenever you, Sujata, send me the date. Good to yes, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, bye. thank you very much. Sir. Gopal, we enjoyed your talk a lot. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Very, very yeah. happy. Very happy. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot.